Uh, so I'm really, really pleased to have you guys join me today. And thank you so much for coming out so early uh, and not Skyping in from bed. That's great. Um, I'll introduce you to everybody uh, and take it from there. This is Zoe Keating. We've got Aaron Myers, Caroline Brooks, and Peter Katz. And I'm Ryan Mulholland. Um, so first of all, all of you are exceptional musicians. And I'm so honored that you, you came and, and spent your time with us because um, Number one, uh, I really wanted to have a panel of people who are both exceptional musicians and also uh, engaged, enthusiastic advocates for things. So maybe we could just go down the line and, and talk a little bit just about each musical um, offering that we have. So do you want to tell us what you do musically? I'm a cellist. I play the cello on the computer. Play my own compositions, are sort of our layered cello confections. Um, and I'm 100% DIY, although I have a booking agent and a licensing agent. Um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> and me. Aaron? Um, I'm a jazz vocalist and a jazz uh, pianist. And um, that's what I do. And I sing so there. Uh, I'm in a band called Good Lovelies. Uh, we're a trio of women from Toronto. So I would say that's my primary outlet for musical creativity. and pretty much my business. Um, I also write music on the side with other people and sing sing and play guitar in other configurations. Whoever will pay me to do so. Hi, I'm Peter Katz, and uh, I'm a singer-songwriter. I've been touring for about 12 years. Uh, different incarnations from solo to too many people to back to solo again and everything in between. Um, yeah, I write most of my own, well, I write all my own stuff. Sometimes I write songs, it's like the best song on the Good Lovelies last record. <laughs> and, um, and then I also actually do a lot of uh, public speaking uh, in my life as well, related to, to music. Um, so I read uh, a really interesting article that you, uh, that Caroline, you penned, um, and it was about being a mom on the road and, and the challenges that come up. And I just wanted to uh, see if you and Zoe would maybe sort of illuminate what that what that is and some of the challenges that yeah, I, I guess I would start by saying that my parents, like, my parents are musicians and they like to joke that they had children so they could have backup singers in the family band. And now that I have kids, I realize there's a like, way cheaper way to do that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I had my first child six years ago and I was the, it, it was a, a very lonely time. It was very stressful. As most of us know, our primary income as a musician comes from playing shows. And uh, my band, we've been pretty much road dogs for the last 12 years. Um, and when I had Annie, we had an entire year of shows booked. So in that first year, um, I first went on the road with her when she was nine weeks old. And we toured um, over 100 shows that year. Wow. And it was very stressful. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie, I wouldn't do it that way again. But at the time, what I felt was we weren't talking about what it's like for parents because you know let's be honest the dads leave as well it's a little different with moms when especially when they're feeding their young from their own bodies so it can be really really hard uh, on us as musicians who don't get a maternity leave um and what i did is i decided to be really honest about it and i wrote a blog that year called mom on the road and it's really uh, wanted to let people know the beauty of touring with your family and what that looks like uh, and also the complete insanity of bringing a child on the road. It's, it's weird enough to raise a kid at home, um, but I did want to lend a bit of normalcy to that nomadic life and what that looked like um, in practice and what were some of the things you could do to make your life e easier. And I, I also, in the last few years, have worked very hard to normalize kids on the road and to talk to presenters to say, here's what you can do. You know, you could choose to give me two bottles of wine backstage, but you know what would really help me instead? Is you could have a pack and play backstage for my kid. And it's as easy to source that as it is to get two bottles. Does that speak to you, Zoe? Yeah, I was gonna say about the advocacy parts is that, um, you know, it is very challenging. And uh, one thing, I had a blog as well, but one reason why I started the blog was because of the situation where um, it dawned on me that some people were not offering me gigs or potential work because they assumed as a mom I would retreat from public life. Yeah. 
And I realized that since so much of an artist's career is like you build it up and build it up so that you can be kind of omnipresent, so you can be the person that they ask, like, oh yeah, let's get that cellist to do it. But if they say, oh, that cellist, she's a mom now, we won't ask her. That could be the end of my career. And I was so, I realized that after some really, really prominent, huge event that was like one of those career breaking things. And they reached out to me to say, hey, can you come to this gig? And I said, actually, that gig coincides with my due date, so I, I can't do it. <laughs> However, the following year, I, I wrote back to the promoter, well, the guy who organized it, and I said, hey, I'm available this year. And he said, oh, I've already got somebody. I just assumed that you weren't doing that, now that you're a mom. Mm. And so one thing, the reason why I started my blog, well, I had a blog, but I started talking about that. And as much as I had reservations about having photographs of my son who's back on the road, um, <laughs> Uh, I felt like it was important to show us touring as a family, to show that I hadn't retreated from public life, but actually it was still going on, and it was normal, and so yes, you can still hire me for things. Yeah. I think that, that whole idea of normalcy as well, and just portraying on social media or on blogs, um, portraying your life, uh, we're all sort of caught as musicians, I think, in how we want to be seen versus how things really are. And um, Peter, have you, have you had experiences of how to balance that? I mean, that's, that's kind of what I actually talk about more in my like speaking life is, mm -hmm. is that disconnect that happens between like who you need to be. And I, I tell the story of like crying on my kitchen floor, feeling like I had failed at everything. Um, and then like a week later, I did the show where there was like hundreds of people there that knew all my songs. This was like, you know, six years ago. And, and so there's a sort of disconnect of feeling like it was all over and then having this like unbelievable moment happen. Um, but you know, one of the things I say in my talk is like, it's not really good for business for me to, like, you know, be live tweeting me on my kitchen floor crying about how I feel like my life is a failure. You know, it's more <laughs> the feed is more You're hired. Exactly. <laughs> wonderful. Let's go see that guy. Um, so you know, it's more about like you know, on stage in front of big crowds and on my you know, my single is doing this and blah blah blah. So I mean, I try to kind of every now and then just do these doses of of real talk um, that. You know, people respond to. Sometimes it's too much, and I'm always trying to figure out the balance. But I, there's, I just kind of hit this point where I'm like, okay, I need to, like, I can't feel like an imposter and an actor in my own life so much, you know. And and I also find that like, I also channel a lot of that energy like into my songs every night, you know. Um, and so sometimes it's actually just a private thing for me. It's like, okay, I know why I'm saying this right now, and it kind of depends if the if laid out, but uh, I, I like to just sort of be real as much as possible. And also just like talking to people after the show. Is sort of, I, I did a show um, just this week, and this uh, it was in a high school, and this kid walked up to me afterwards, and he said, uh, he's like, I Googled your net worth while you were up there. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, what did you find? He's like, I couldn't find anything. He <laughs> said, accurate. Like, yeah. So it's an opportunity to have like a real discussion about what it's actually like. And not to like say it's terrible, but to be like, you know, what you might think is right. not necessarily what it is. Well, Zoe was one of the first uh, artists who started posting, you started posting your Spotify numbers and yeah. actually what that uh, what that was. What was sort of the psychological impact of, of, of putting that out there? Well, um, similarly to the reason why I was blogging my family life as I was touring, I started blogging about what I was actually making from streaming services because it's like, I felt like uh, the DIY side of the story wasn't being told. And so I used my blog as a way to say, hey, this is actually what the income balance is like for me. And um, I didn't feel any shame or anything about showing my numbers. So um, actually, Spotify had come out with a campaign at the time. At their first, it was like they were launching in North America. And um, one of the ads was, never pay for music again. And then the other one was all about how they were going to save the industry. And I was like, wait a minute. I actually earn most of my living from sales of downloads and um, by telling my story as a DIY artist that the people know I'm a real person and there's no corporation between me and, and the listener. And um, so I, I wanted to say like, you know what, there are pockets, maybe in the world of pop it's different, but in, in other worlds, like in other musical genres, there are artists making money and I'm actually making money you know, and spot, this is what I make from streaming. So I just started publishing all of my, not just my Spotify, people latched up to that, but like all of my music income, like 
what's the balance this year between my licensing revenue and my physical sales and my live shows? And, and we don't have that information. It's so hard, I think, for people starting out as artists to know, like, well, what's normal? And, and it's always the case that, you know, like my licensing agent and my booking agent aren't that fond of it because they always want to make you look as big as possible, right? <laughs> there, it's, there's like a lot of deliberate obfuscation in the music industry because everybody wants to see more from than they really are. <laughs> um, but um, I feel like it's sort of along the, the way that people, you know, by publishing salaries, you can actually create equality. And I believe in like making a more equal world means that we have to share this information. So, long story. Yeah. Um, so, uh, just a tidbit of information um, about Aaron. Now, you can tell me if this is true or not, but you're the youngest person to ever run for mayor in Texas? In of course in Canada, Texas. I was 20. <laughs> I was 20, and, I, and um, I, I was in the Army, and I hurt my back, and I got out of the military. And at the time when newspapers were starting to come online, and uh, I was looking, not many people's hometowns were online. You could, so all of my friends would be, you know, in the military would be online looking at my, where I'm from, and it was a shit show. Uh, I mean, the mayor had resigned, the city manager had been fired, two wow. city council people had been recalled. <laughs> and so uh, I got back there and I told my government teacher, enrolled in Texas A&M, and I, I told my Navarro College at Texas A&M, and I, um, I told my professors, like, I think I should run for office or whatever. And I ran, I, you know, entered my name, and someone asked, why are you doing that? Like, I could not do any worse than what you all already do. <laughs> I could not do any worse. And although, and I was the youngest person, I was the only black, I think I may have been the second black person to run for office there. And among the death threats and among the breaking into my home and among all that other stuff and stealing the signs and all that other, they accused me of being a drug dealer. Uh, or no, they, after I, I felt like I won a forum or a debate and I felt so good afterwards. And uh, someone called me and said, Aaron, have you seen the paper this morning? I was like, no, I'm not seeing the paper, what's going on? You should really go down and get a paper. I was like, what? On the front page, you know, Aaron Myers admits to selling drugs at the forum. I was like, what? How did that happen? I got more press out of the retraction of that than anything. So I did lose. And um, But the things on my ballot were the first things initiated. And I did not share ballot points with anybody else. So it showed me that uh, regardless of age, if you do see a solution, then you, all you have to do is put it out there. And the real winning part of that is that you don't have to be the person praised or for getting that done you, as long as the solution is implemented. And that's kind of shaped how I do things. And I feel as though sort of the message that I'm hearing too is this transparency, so sharing what things actually are, and then you can find solutions. And um, I feel really badly that I'm using this uh, reuse, this coffee cup that is recycled, but, recyclable, but perhaps you could speak a little bit, because you, you do a lot of environmentally uh, advocacy, environmental advocacy, and you see solutions that are easy, and I'm sorry. No, it's, it's, but, but, that, but I think that's that, that one, one of the most important things that, I, that, I'm, that I'm so inspired by all of you is also just a transparency, um, as, as you did with uh, posting your streaming and just your income, and again, finding the solution. So what, what do you see, too, in what your environmental advocacy? <laughs> yeah, well, I... Um, our band has been quite vocal, particularly on the plastic water bottle front. We feel pretty strongly that this industry is is not being necessarily a leader, and I'm talking about the music industry. Um, there are great solutions, they're so easy, and I see that Folk Alliance is doing it. Like It's as simple as putting a table with a pitcher of water and some glasses on it, and it's it's very simple. Um, so yeah, our band has, has a no plastic water bottle policy on our rider, and no store with styrofoam takeout containers as part of that as well. And it's just a simple thing, and I can't tell you how many presenters have said to me, I love that you do this. And I think it's, um, there are these great people in the UK who started this organization called Gakeswig, and it's all about um, bringing your reusable containers, bringing your own um, plastic, um, bringing your own water bottles instead of using plastic backstage. Um, so yeah, it's, it's uh, it's not it's not a sexy issue, <laughs> but it is a very solvable issue. And we were talking briefly last night about finding solutions and and um, working towards it. And it's it's not always easy, but having the positivity and working to, towards that that end goal of not putting any more plastic water bottles into the ocean is actually it's it's a very simple thing. 
and I feel really engaged by that. And I'm now working I'm with the City of Toronto Circular Economy Working Group, which is a mouthful. Mm -hmm. Basically just looking at solutions in the City of Toronto about how we can reduce single-use plastics. And, and being engaged at that level, like in policy, can be very um, boring. It can be, uh, yeah, it's a lengthy process, but what, when I'm sitting in those rooms and we're talking about these issues and what we can do, um, I feel, I feel like, I feel engaged and I feel like that is feeding a part of me that also leads into my creative work and it makes me feel engaged and, and uh, part of a solution, uh, which is very, very important rather than just throwing my hands up and saying, we're completely screwed because the, the oceans are below plastic. You know what I mean? Like if we can move towards some kind of goal, I think it, it, it allows us to be um, more full humans. Do you feel at all vulnerable kind of coming out? Speak, as you said, not a sexy topic. Did you feel there were any repercussions that you would you would experience? Well, I I didn't at first, but I did realize I had to be more mindful of the conversation. So it's not it is not I say it's a simple thing, but it is not simple. There are lots of communities in Canada that don't have drinking water. <laughs> like literally, you cannot get fresh, clean drinking water from your taps in Canada. Um, many of them are indigenous communities. So when I started this conversation. I did have some people check me, and I, I'm really grateful for it. It, it. I had to, you know, really swallow that feeling of like, okay, I'm not, I can't just say, let's get rid of plastic water bottles. Here's a solution, because it's not fully realistic in in some communities. Um, so that was difficult for me, and also there's uh, there's a bit of a perception that that issue in particular is a first world issue. You know what I mean? Like, we're at a point where we can talk about talk about it, but there are, like I said, there are communities that still really rely on it. And there's whole cities in there that you can't get yeah. Yeah, so. it's, it's, yeah, there's a place called Flint. 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 <laughs> but I, I, I do, I want to ask you a question regarding that. I'm sorry, but no, no, I'm about to say they're indigenous. I, we, we screwed over the indigenous population in the United States, right? So that's, you know, we've, <laughs> we'll never be right. But um, I was not aware that you all are aware of the not being the entire community you're saying can you? Yeah, there are many places, even just in Ontario, oh, everywhere across Canada where you can't get clean drinking water. In a lot of those communities are indigenous communities, so on reserves and um Is there anything being done? Like, no, uh they're trying or various anything? degrees of things being done, but it's yeah, very disappointing. Yeah, and, and a very vulnerable community obviously. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanna speak a little bit more about that vulnerability because um, so Zoe, when you were publishing your income and, and Spotify, I don't mean to pick on Spotify, but, but did you feel at all vulnerable or, or nervous about repercussions that would sure. happen? I think, you know, you have to have a thick skin when you're a musician, obviously, because um, I think most of the response is positive, but there's always a few that are really negative, and I'm sure you've all got the thing where someone says, stay in your lane. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> stay in your lane, you know, yeah. just shut up and make music. Um, you know, various versions of that are are um, probably the, the biggest thing I get. And so I just think that, you know, no matter how much a mess all these, these things are in the world, you know, but we don't have any hope if nobody does anything. If, there's, if you say like, oh, there's so much plastic in the ocean, I'm like, I can't even bother, you know, we do, we do that. So I feel like, you know, each person makes it a different way they can. So I just, I just try to like, you know, block that out <laughs> as much as I can. That's, that's very hard. And, and also, not to be rude. I have really heard not to be rude. Peter, yeah. Can I ask Zoe a question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I no, have, I've written down the panelists ask questions okay. for each other. No, I'm just kidding. But, you know, like earlier you talked about you know how your your booking agent and your licensing person weren't thrilled <laughs> about you publishing these things and the sort of potential undermining of your value that that, that creates. And I've definitely. Um, come up against that as well, and I don't know that I've like come up with a a resolution to it yet. So, um, so I just just wanted to, to hear what your experience was. That like, did, did they change their mind, or did you just do it anyways? Um, I kind of always just do everything anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> For better or worse. Right. I mean, uh, within reason. But um, I think it's always it's worked out because it's part of my identity is that I'm known for speaking out, and so I want to be you know known for speaking out. I don't think it hurts me at all. Um, I think where it gets hard is that sometimes um, 
if that's the only story that's out there. Like I did pull back for a while because I felt like people only knew me as the streaming royalty cellist. Uh -huh. And I didn't actually know my music, which is of course what I wanted to be known for. Um, and so I just you know pulled back and let some other people talk for a while. And, and um, but you know that that's it's always a a thing of the fear. You know, like our lives are so unstable, and we're so there's so many things sometimes it's like they can just pull the rug out from under you, and we don't want to be the one to create that rug pulling. And but I think ultimately truthfulness, uh, transparency, always wins out. So. Um, probably your agents, so the people they're trying to sell license my music to, they're probably going to find out during the negotiation that it's not worth as much as they're saying anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> Eric, do you want to speak to that as well? Because you, you you have a really different experience on stage. I feel as though when you're singing and performing, your relationship to your audience has been you know, very direct. Um, I try to. I, I, I think it's because I started in the church years. You know, that's why in my community. A lot of people introduced to music, and it's fostered in the church. And um, the best way, I hate to say it, but it's the truth. You know, if you don't know how to raise money and sell some albums in person, go to a black church. <laughs> <laughs> we have taught you how to engage that audience and make sure they know that, honey, this building fund must be built, okay? <laughs> you know, get those tithes and offering. And so I always let everyone know. And again, in my shows, that this is a, a safe space uh, and for anybody. And I think that's, I, I think the musicians don't do that enough, actually, um, because um, people are, people don't always feel as safe as you do on stage. And we have the music really to blanket us, um, but there could be a couple of walks in and immediately because of who they are, they will feel uncomfortable. Or because of the makeup of the group, they feel not welcomed and to lead in saying that you you are safe because I've said that you're safe here. I think it sets a tone that uh, it kind of relieves or alleviates any of that bad energy or that hatefulness or even kind of stops anyone who may think and consider of being rude uh, or not welcoming to your or to people who come to see you, you know? That's the first thing. But then second of all, um, the vulnerability. I talk about depression, I live with it. I talk about that in person. Uh, but also the solutions and the problems that we've faced in the community. Um, I test out those solutions and if they're even interesting to others on the audience. And I kind of try to bring the audience into that process. The, the, the difficulty becomes where is the cutoff place where the audience cannot be. And it is only your sacred space, you know. And like you were saying, you're on the floor crying. That is not the place to, you know, live stream, of course. <laughs> But it is a space you have to be in, you have to experience. I, I know that we were, uh, we decided to, um, there was a club in Washington, D.C. called the Human Caverns. It had Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, 70 years, whatever. And it was closed down because the, um, uh, the rent got too high. Uh, the guy who owned it didn't live in Washington, and the business was still renting. And uh, the young guy who was trying to keep it going, I think the rent got up to like fifteen thousand dollars a month or something of that nature, and uh, there was just no way for him to keep it. And so, before we know it, knew it, it was closed down. And the last night was Easter, and I still play for a church as well. And uh, I, I'm on the board of directors for the Capitol Jazz Foundation. The guy called me, he's like, "Are you coming to sing? Are you going to be there?" I said, "I'd rather not go to a funeral. I'd rather do something that is going to help keep things alive." Um, I've been to enough funerals at that time. And I think from there, I had to really shift my thinking to say, if I want to speak on stage, I can't be perpetuating something that I can do nothing about. Uh, if it's dead, it's dead. If the problem is not too far gone, if the problem uh, is only in problem form, I can't talk about it. But if I've done my due diligence, and I can include my audience and say, look, I found a solution, and I want you, you specifically, to meet me. I want you, if you're interested, I want to give you 10 minutes to kind of gather myself up for the show, meet me afterwards, and then we can do something. And you would be surprised how many people will stay. I remember I did this thing at this like uh, uh, wine bar or whatever, and I mentioned about the school children, uh, the adult people ride free who are trying to get their GEDs. And, uh, 
went 10 minutes, I come back through, and the audience is still there. And I'm like, oh, you, you do want to be a part of this. Mm -hmm. And active work began, you know. Um, when we started doing the thing about getting uh, money back to small venues who offer live music in DC, if you sit uh, uh, less than 300 people and you offer live music 48 hours a month or more, uh, you get up to $15,000 a year back towards your business from your property tax. Um, when I first went out and I said, well, yeah, there's a hearing going on and I want people to know this is, this is what's going on. Uh, literally, I got to the hearing late because that's what we do when you just had a gig that ended at 1 a.m. and they decided to do a fucking hearing at 7.30 in the morning <laughs> on like a Thursday or whatever. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, I get there and there are people from the gig last night in the audience who are there and they're posting on Instagram and they were like, we don't know what to say. Some were so frightened to even speak, but they knew the importance of being there. Your audience is showing up for you. They want to be there. They want to be there. And if you want to be there, if you want to be a part of that solution, if you want to promote that solution, they will join you. And I have not, they have not let me down yet. Now, the musicians will let you down. They won't, they may not show up all the time, but they'll ask you on the next gig, how did that go? The did she go you were talking about? Or how did that pan out? Or how did it turn out? But the audience doesn't. And then I also, and I'm sorry, I don't know Bogart or anything, but I also feel that once you've been able to show a solution, you must recognize a win. And the win may not look like what you want it to look like in the big, bigger scale. Uh, I know that I have had a hard time in my career uh, as a jazz artist recognizing when I've actually made progress. I've had a hard time. Um, you go to these conferences and sometimes you get so much discouraging information from label owners or from PR folks and from licensing and booking folks, festival folks who are reporting their numbers, which sometimes is a hard, you know, as a festival runner, how difficult if you publish what actually happened. Uh, but I have, I've found in my life that, and in my career that once I can say, you know what, I had a show, people showed up, they were polite, they listened, they stayed engaged. They bought two albums, which is great. Uh, they tipped. They got on the email list. They decided they would, you know, they emailed their Congress, whoever, or their city council person. That's a success. That's a win. Yeah. I love, I mean, I want to talk about success uh, in a minute, but I want to dig back into something you said that I, I think is really interesting. And it's just about drawing a line. So, mm -hmm. especially as an advocate, where do you draw the line? Uh, personally, and I'd love to hear from all of you about where you're drawing the line between your your private on the floor in your kitchen and uh, and and also publicly. So, Caroline, what do you what are your sort of rules and engagement? This is a, a question I think about a lot actually, because my main platform um, is through a band called like the, so the Good Lovelies, my best friends are in that band, but I have to be really careful because. I can't always speak for them as well. So we're really always talking about what makes us comfortable. So in this past Christmas tour, we do a big Christmas tour every year, I wanted to raise money for um, a couple of organizations. One was the David Suzuki Foundation, which is an easy sell to people. It's not hard to get people on board to reflect their due. The other thing I wanted to raise money for was Wellington Water Watchers. They're based in Guelph area, actually. Um, and they, they work they're like, they're basically, their mandate is to stop Nestle. And it was an interesting conversation to have because, I mean, if you look at our audience, it's mostly an older, white, middle-class CBC listener who's coming to our shows, which are generally progressive. Um, so they might be open to the water issue, but we did have to have some conversations because we knew we would alienate some people. And um, at the end of the day, I might be more comfortable with alienating some people than Carrie and Sue might be. So we have all these really open, honest conversations about what we could do as a band, and then separately, I can I can use my personal voice in a different way. But that's a great question. I do think it's a constantly um, evolving thing about that line where we draw it, what pushes us, what makes us crazy uh, enough. Or sorry, I shouldn't use that word. What make what drives us? Um, to take action, 
And at what point do we have to draw back and say, okay, is this actually going to accomplish what we need to happen? Or are we just alienating people to a point where they will just no longer listen? So how do we gather people in? So yeah, uh, our, that line is constantly shifting in my mind. It's a shifting view, Zoe, do you feel the same way? I think it's always shifting, yeah. And, and then there's, there's different you know, elements of being a public musician. Like when I'm on stage, I don't have any skin. <laughs> you know, it, it is me and the audience, and we are going someplace together. <laughs> and if, it, if you succeed, it's like, I'm going there and they're coming with me. And um, I try, I don't ever analyze it. Like, that's what it is. I don't put any barriers there. If I try to, I don't think I could anyway. <laughs> um, and then, so like the, the music making process for me is really like honest and there is no barrier. But then in order to record and compose the music, it's very private. I don't let, that's a very private thing that nobody's there but me. Um, and then for my my speaking life, I feel like that's like my blog and talking about stuff is a chance for me to kind of like, you know, I'm a solo musician. I play mostly by myself on the side on tour, like I'm going on tour with Virgin Duke in May and June. Um, so unless I'm playing with some other artists, I'm by myself. And so, um, I write about things, but I do find, you know, I, I went through a, a very traumatic experience four years ago, and I don't, I don't really talk about that too much because that was a really private, personal thing. That the repercussions of it and the kind of life I have as a result of that, I talk about. But actually, my personal experience of what that was, I don't. I just, I just get up there on stage and play instrumental music with no skin on. It's yours. Yes, that's that, my that's yours. That, yeah. That's you get to hold on. Yeah. To that. Yeah. But all this stuff, I talk about all the things around it. Right. <laughs> Does that sound similar to you? Yeah, the, the thing that comes to mind to me is like, I think kind of the same way that I, I work as an artist is like, something hits me and I have to write about it. I sort of, there's some stuff that I just can't shut up about and no matter what anybody says, I'm like, I have to say something, you know? Mm -hmm. So like I did a tour a year and a half ago and that was or maybe two years ago there was a lot of news about omar cotter who was the uh, he was you know canadian uh who was in afghanistan uh you know there was you know there was he was accused of uh and i whether he did or not i we don't have to get into the specifics of it um, but you know essentially he was a child soldier who there was a grenade thrown a person was killed a u.s soldier was killed and he was held in guantanamo bay for 10 years, uh, I think he was like 10 years older. I don't wanna put miss facts out there, but, um, and uh, anyways, so there was, he was, you know, eventually brought back to Canada and, you know, many politicians, um, you know, this is a terrorist, blah, blah, blah. And meanwhile, we have laws in Canada that say like, if you're a 10 year old and you're in the war, that's like not your fault, you know? And so I invited him to my show because um, I knew he was living in Edmonton and, uh, and he came, <laughs> and uh, and I, I welcomed him, and uh, and I met him, and I talked to him afterwards, and you know we text each other sometimes, and he's like a lovely, wonderful, like incredibly kind person who, you know, was tortured for ten years, just the most unbelievable conditions, and so when I hear you know even politicians now just like. A couple weeks ago, it, it sort of bubbled up again, and you know, people are saying this guy's a dangerous terrorist, and I'm just like, no, <laughs> you know, like, first of all, that's like that's not our laws in Canada; those are not our, you know, that and uh, people can have different values. But I just was like, I have to say something about this, and uh, I posted a photo of, of he and I after my show, and I said, you know, the the, the path to the path to better humanity is forgiveness, and and and. Uh, <laughs> rehabilitation and uh and and i took some flack for it you know i took a lot of I, I, people in my family like i took some flack for it but i was like i actually i don't care i have to say something about this so it's almost as if um so art is sort of the the biggest advocate for empathy uh and sort of transmuting that kind of thing and um peter you 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 had a song at fences the fence, the yeah. fence yeah um about matthew shepherd mm -hmm. that came out in 2000 uh, yeah, I had written it earlier, but it came yeah. out in And I think that was my first experience listening to a piece of music that was so specifically about something 
uh, and actually um, immediately brought the audience that sense of empathy. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you could just tell everybody about, about it. Yeah, so it's a, a song I wrote for a young man named Matthew Shepard, who's a, many people know who he was, but he was a 20-year-old student from Laramie, Wyoming, who was a victim of a hate crime because he was gay. And uh, and he was picked up by a bar, at a bar by these two guys, driven outside of town, tied to the fence, and then beaten up, and uh, was there for 18 hours by himself, found the next day, and ended up dying. And it was a huge, you know, sensation in, in the U.S. Um, and, uh, and I, there was this beautiful play actually called The Laramie Project that was written about it, and I was in that show, and the director asked me to write a song for it. So I wrote this song, and I always tell Matthew's story on stage. Um, and it's been a real opportunity, especially now that I, I you know, do some stuff in high schools. I always, I was, I'm really open, you know? I, I, like, one of the things I talk about is, like, being vulnerable, and one of the things that you can do when you're vulnerable is, like, telling your mom and dad that you're gay, those kind of things, just really opening up. And I use Matthew's story as, as part of the kind of advocacy for, for spreading that, that people need to talk about this. And you know, something that I was thinking of as we were up on this panel is like, as much as it's hard and it's challenging, I feel like speaking up for those things has also led to some of the most incredible moments. Like you do take the flack, but you also get these like unbelievable things. Like I was invited to play that song um, uh, right before Matthew's mother, Judy Shepard, spoke at York, York University. So I'm like standing there, there's a thousand people, um, you know, there's many from the LGBTQ, um, you know, community, and, you know, Matthew's mom, who's like this amazing advocate who, you know, got this Matthew Shepard bill passed in Congress, which was the first time that they recognized, like, discriminating somebody for their their gender, uh, their sexual orientation as a, as a hate crime. And so I got to like play this song for this room of people and meet Judy and like, you know, so there's this amazing richness that comes. And I could tell you more stories of other songs of, that have, you know, brought me to all these places. So there's also a real richness and meaning. And, you know, when you're in the music business sometimes and it feels like, oh, it's singles. And you know, you're just like, sort of like, oh, what am I doing? And it just feels like this, this dirty business thing. You have these moments where like, I would pay all the money in the world to have those experiences. Well, I feel like it speaks to sort of what Aaron was saying about those about celebrating the wins mm -hmm. yeah. and knowing what those are and and then going from them. Caroline, do you have a do you have a similar experience where you think you had um, some, some sort of a win that, in retrospect, you could kind of keep with you? Yeah, I think um, touring with my kids pretty nonstop for uh, five years. They're not here this weekend, which is really nice. Uh, <laughs> have you had lots of sleep? I have not slept, but I'm telling you, I have been training for Folk Alliance for six years. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's fine. Um, no, I, um, I I did speak a little bit about like those early years of touring with my um, my girl, and then, then taking a second child on the road and like going to Australia for a month with two kids <laughs> under the age of five. It's really, um, there are moments like where I'm thinking, what the hell am I doing? Like, why am I doing this? It would be cheaper for me to stay home and not make music <laughs> and just be like a full-time mom because frankly, at this point, I'm paying to bring my kids on the road. But the wins for me are the connection I have with the audience, people who say, to me, um, other musicians who come up, and I'm able to talk about my experience and empower them um, to try as well, because there uh, are a lot of incredible moms uh, out there who are making the most incredible music, and we don't want them to be silent. So just allowing um, those experiences that I had, and that the blog, writing the blog as an outlet, not just an outlet, but a way to show that there is a, a way to do this. It is very tiring, it's very challenging, but giving giving voice to that, for me, that was the win. Um, because I felt like, uh, even though I, it was very stressful and all those things, like having, I'm not articulating this properly, what I'm trying to say is having other moms come to me and say, thank you for doing that, or um, how did you do that, even frankly? Someone asking me, like, how, how did that work for you on a practical level? That to me is a win, because it allows, it lets me know that other people are considering it as well. Um, so you were smiling during oh, that. <laughs> no, I was just thinking, I just want to say thank you for framing the thing of thinking about your wins. I, I, I feel like I've learned a lot just now, because 
I never do that. Yeah. And just by putting it that way, you made me think back to like all these wonderful things that have <laughs> So I just want to say, if anybody takes anything out of that panel, just that's it. <laughs> um, speaking of the wins, and, and I think this idea of empathy and, and advocating for whatever you believe in and whatever you, you care about, and, and using music as that sort of battering ram with empathy. Um, uh, Aaron, you were involved in the Obama campaign and this idea of hope, and I think one of, the, one of the most exciting things about having you all here is that idea of hope and idea of finding solutions and, mm -hmm. and making those changes. Do you want to speak to what that was like in that, to be in that room where it happened kind of thing? Uh, oh yeah, I was, um, at the, so at, at the time I was in Hollywood at first and um, I was working, <laughs> So Hollywood is not the best place for a jazz musician to be. I just let me just so if you're thinking if I can give any advice, just know that that can't be your only bag if you go to Hollywood, all right? Now if you want to do rock and do heroin, uh, I'm telling you, you can have a good situation there for you, the whiskey and go-go. But um, I was in Hollywood, so I was doing like four different things. I was working as a uh, VP with uh, Universal Jazz Entertainment. Uh, we were doing party promotion doing my jazz, I was also playing in theater, I was also a session musician, just trying to eat because for some reason, a guy, a 20 something year old, who had never had money and never experienced stuff from the country, I got a little money in my pocket, I bought me a white Mercedes and I moved on Sunset, like this. <laughs> Two dumbest things in the classic thing, I had a white living room furniture, it was like, yes, but um, it was bad. And so um, I, was, uh, <laughs> I was in that position and um, around my birthday, my birthday is July 27th, and I always believed in doing a birthday with a cause, always, always. I did uh, LA AIDS Healthcare Foundation, uh, National Cancer Society, Autism for America, Autism Speaks, and so uh, I, one of, I was doing this mentorship thing, and one of the young people I was working with had this book called uh, uh, Dreams of My Father, yeah. Brown's book, and, um, and I've, I've spoken openly about the relationship that my father and I had the issues that we dealt with. And so um, I read the book, and it caused me to go to Borders off of Sunset and um, uh, Vine and look for more stuff about this dude named Barack. And this guy, my, this young person, was like, I think he'll be the president. I'm like, his name is Barack Obama, no he won't. <laughs> um, but, you know, to cut a long story short, I, I left Hollywood, I went back to Texas. I threw, a, I threw a party for him in Hollywood. I threw a pre-election birthday bash for Barack. And I did it at a place called Center Space off of uh, Vine and Hollywood. Uh, and it's a place that the Academy also uses. And um, I had bands in the back, and the DJ comes over in the front and sat me out there. At about 10.40, bouncer came to me, he said, you should really see this. I went out, and there was a line around the building. Now, in Hollywood, people in July, July before, you know, the year before an election's happening, these people were interested in Barack Obama. I'm like, this guy's going to win. I went back to Texas um, and decided to kind of regroup. I got a phone call on a Sunday from the Obama campaign saying, hey, we heard that you ran for office here so many years ago. We can't get into the county. Could you help us? I'm like, yes, first you'll pay me. Second, um, and that's true, because they're making God off of their reason. But second, I said, if you're going to run for office in Texas, you never call anyone on the Sunday for political reasons. Yeah. Yeah. This little hint for you, you know, uh, and then I'll go to the debate. And I worked for nine months on that campaign off of one guy, Barack, gave me a sense of hope that ever since I've been in fourth grade, I've wanted to be like the first black president or something. And I was hoping that, that I wouldn't have to wait that long, that that was going to be cut short and he could do it. He could possibly make this happen. And I'd written a song when I was in Hollywood, when I was actually homeless in Hollywood before, and called What's a Man to Do? And uh, the part of it says, don't give up, don't give in, you know, uh, uh, don't give out, don't give in. But what's a man to do? You've just got to stay in this game. For nine months, 14 hour days, seven days a week, worked on the campaign. He gets elected. But I said, said the story last night. I, um, election night, you know, it was interviews and I worked as a field organizer. By this time I was in Florida. And then after uh, he got elected, I went outside and called my grandmother, who was 91 or 92 at the time. Black woman, her grandmother was a slave. Her grandson worked on the campaign of the first African American to become president. Uh, she knew her grandmother, a slave. And I'm calling her now and I'm saying, Granny, you just became president. How do you think he's going to do? And she literally said, He'll do just as well as the rest of them. Uh -huh. Which is a reality. 
We're all human. We all can do the best that we can. But you got to do something. You got to be in a space where you're doing something. And being able to do something is my hope. Like uh, when I do the song Black Lives Matter, it's difficult sometimes to do it in front in a southern city sometimes or in front of an all white audience where I'm the only one keenly aware that all the staff is black in the back and no one else seems to realize that. And I'm doing the song Black Lives Matter and I see over the audience as people become keenly aware, aware of what they're doing and what's happened. You know, you can't, you can't apologize for being white no more than I can apologize for being black. But you can cede some power and get rid of some of the power structures, uh, systemic uh, uh, biases in the structures in which we power is contained. You can cede some of that, you can change that. Uh, but I have to advocate for myself. And I have to advocate for the white allies, the brothers and sisters who also believe that same thing. They don't know how to explain that to their sisters or to their boss or to their mom or whatever. And I hope the music I give, that's what I, I, I believe firmly before we do any advocating, it's music first. And also, uh, I love what you yeah. said, you have to advocate for yourself. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'd love to just touch on one more thing and then I think we'll take some questions from the audience, but um, it's that idea of inspiration. So having something to look for, somebody who's inspired you. Peter, do you have anybody who has inspired you to sort of start this, this journey of advocacy? Um, I mean, spe specifically advocacy. Um, I mean, there's an artist that, that that I kind of that was a big part of the kind of genesis of, of me playing music, which is Glenn Cancer. Um, and you know, the night that I decided to play music for the rest of my life was the night that I saw Glenn play. And uh, and you know, despite having just played in front of like a thousand people, uh, he was just gracious, kind, and warm, and asked me questions about me. And uh, he actually, I, I met him outside on his, his tour bus. You know, he, I was like waiting outside in the cold. And uh, and I just kind of poured my heart out to him. I was like, no, I'm so great. And like, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and he just kind of like stopped and, and looked at me and uh, and sort of was like, oh, this guy like really cares. And then he brought me back inside and he brought me up on the stage. It was a convocation hall uh, at the U of T campus. And he's like, check this out. You know, he's like, someday you're gonna, you're gonna be here. And then he's like, what are you doing right now? Like, let's go for drinks and so we went for drinks and like he introduced me to, like Damien Rice and Lisa Hannigan and we all just like hung out and but Glenn was just like super warm and kind and I feel like that taught me that you can be a star and you can also be kind and you can be grounded and you can be honest. humble and honest mm -hmm. you know and so I feel like that kind of set the trajectory for me is like as much as we do need to like give this value in the sense of like exclusivity um, there's a higher value in, in being a, a real person and, and being grounded and treating people as you would want to be treated. What about you, Zoe? Is there anybody that you can think of? Honestly, my mom. <laughs> That's a great answer. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I just feel like my mom, she's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she went through a lot. My, my family, we didn't have money and we struggled. And, you know, she was an immigrant and, you know, on welfare. And, um, she always got me cello lessons, she always got me to my lesson, you know, like, and she always loved me, and I feel like that's just, I, I feel like I just, I just want to, I just want to live up to everything she did. Caroline? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say my parents, too, um, you said it so beautifully, and, um, yeah, they just really modeled to me what, what it can be, like, writing your best music, my parents, I mentioned earlier, my parents are musicians, and, just really working on your craft, but also, yeah, being kind and dragging your kids to folk festivals, <laughs> that kind of thing, it's really important. And I'd say now, as I get older, um, I'm really inspired by my peers, like people who, who just say what they have to say and are unabashed about it. Because I might not ever be that person, but I think I do take inspiration in in folks that feel like they can just lay it all out there. You know, it's it's just a beautiful thing. I sort of feel as if this panel's been a bit of a, a giant hug. So <laughs> thank you all for, for being here, and I want to thank Music Canada for sponsoring this panel and bringing you all in. <laughs> it's really, really inspiring, and I wonder if there's questions
questions in the audience. Does anyone have any questions for our guests? I don't have enough. I don't have a walk around microphone, so I'll just go. Well, I'm good. me. Yeah, okay. it's you. Yeah. All right. Um, so for those of you who write songs with lyrics that may have um, the topical or issue advocacy content, uh, do you view there to be a difference between songs that uh, are uh, entertaining the troops, preaching to the choir, and songs that reach across the divide of that particular issue to convince people, and where do you feel your stuff fits involved? That's a great question. I think that um, there is important space for both. You have to have rallying songs. So people will know that they're not crazy as you wanted to say that. They won't know that they're out of touch. They won't know that they're alone. A rallying song is meant to say, you think this and I think this. You're not out of your head to think this because I think this too. You know. So those are very important. The songs that reach across what I you're saying a lot in the States, those songs that reach across the aisle, I don't think can ever be written on purpose. I think they happen to be heard and accepted and experienced by both sides of the aisle and they're drawn together. But I don't think any matter of intentionality could do that because then the authenticity of it is not really there. You know, you, you can't write a song just to bring everybody together. You can write music and if it's authentically written, that will bring people together. Aretha just wrote music, you know, she just wrote music. And well, she covered music very well as well. You know what <laughs> but she did her thing, and then people realized at this wedding with this GOP right wing, this, that, and the other, that they're dancing, they're doing their first dance to Saretha Franklin or whatever, and they're like, whoa, well, yeah, you like this too, and I like this too. Maybe we can talk about this in this meeting before we start. That might give us some more common ground so that we can compromise and we both get a little something that we want. But I think that it's important to write those rally songs. It's very important to write the rallying songs because rallying songs are your truth. And that's where you fit. You, you have to tell the truth about what you, what's going on in your situation and what you're saying. And believe it or not, in my opinion, those rallying songs are little, little pockets out of global consciousness. We all, it's a snapshot. Uh, I did this thing, I don't read, but this thing is 1968 Project, right? This uh, with the, uh, the DC uh, Humanities Council. And basically, you, we, they were trying to authentically tell what was going on in 1968. And I did a music snapshot. Do you know what uh, the first, the number one song going in 1968 was? Hello, Goodbye. If that's no better title to what 1968 was going to be, it would be that. But then, the last number one song on the last day of the year was I Heard It Through the Great by Pine. But not by Gladys Knight and the Pips, who had already been in the top 10 the first of the year, by Marvin Gaye. The changeover of how the music was being interpreted and people taking this thing into their own hands. You know, so I think our music is a snapshot of what's happening now that can never be erased. It can never be erased whatsoever. You will be able, 100 years ago, be able to tell what happened in 2019, 2018 by the music that's being released and it will forever be an, an honest capsule. So that's why I don't think you can honestly write something just, that's just gonna bring people together. When people here in America, I'm proud to be an American or whatever. At least I know I'm free. Listen, as a black dude here now, I'm like, shit, okay, who's here? And where do I need to run? Where are the exits, okay? Just in case, you know. You know, those songs are not rallying songs for everyone, you know? And likewise, when I start singing the Negro National Anthem, so people were like, okay, what's going to happen here, you know? So I have to be realistic about that. That's how I feel. Does anyone else have anything? Um, I tend to write a lot of songs that are sort of looking at um, different sides of the situation in that sense of kind of coming together. And I've had some challenges and some issues with people mistaking my lyrics. Or for example, I wrote a song that was really bearing witness to the conflict in Israel and was not necessarily from anyone's perspective, but just kind of holding the heartbreak of it, and had a, like some Palestinians come up to me and feel very like triggered, and, and I just wonder how you manage holding that space. Peter, do you want to, just from your, so, seems like relevant, yes. a relevant question. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a tricky thing, you know, like Caroline was talking earlier about how sometimes like, you have to kind of swallow those feelings of people like being negative towards you, and, and I think, I, again, I won't speak for anybody else, but I know, like, for me, 
because maybe I'm an artist and there's that sensitivity thing, it's like, oh my gosh, that's, that's hard when anybody says, says anything against you. Um, but I mean, first and foremost, it's like, as long as you know what that thing is, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of explanation you can do afterwards on social media or whatever. Well, this is what I really thought. And there's a certain amount of people that are, will listen to that. And there's a certain amount of people that will never see it. But I think it, it has to do just with your own inner sense of intentionality. You know, when you put your head on the pillow at night and you're going to sleep, you're like, well, what did I mean? You know, and am I proud of that? And, and I feel like that's kind of all, all we have. And, and, you know, I feel like we can, we can be advocates for like directly for issues. Like, you know, I'm talking about the Israel Palestine issue, or I'm talking, you know, I have a song I wrote about a, a man who's, you know, chose forgiveness in the face of this, this person that killed his son in, in Iraq, you know, and, and, uh, and sometimes people are like, you know, really angry about that and other people are not. And, but then we can also like, I feel like writing a really brave love song or a really brave song for your kids or like whatever it might be it's it's like it's more about like what is that artistic impulse and if it comes out as a protest song or it comes out as long as it's like truth for you then that's 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 what matters don't be scared <laughs> i was going to say um i think the fact that you got somebody to respond means that you succeeded as a songwriter i agree whatever their response is um and uh i think i write music that doesn't have any words or lyrics and so it's always a thing of people coming up to me after a show and I, I get emails about what this song means to them or like their child was born to it or they walked down the aisle to it or all these things that they take on and I'll never correct them. I'll never say what it's really about because <laughs> it is what it is for them. Yeah. So on the one hand, you're like, it's not this way, it's going to be this way. That doesn't matter. Like once you've really set up, it's the world now. <laughs> and so I feel like our job is to like help people express things that they might not be able to with regular words or to trigger a conversation or, you know, so. Yeah, the worst reaction you could get is apathy. Yeah, um, nothing. Nobody says anything. Good lesson. Anyone else? <laughs> See. Um, I'm going to articulate this. You know, if I think that music should be a forum for your opinion about any subject as an artist. When you're doing something that is controversial, what is what is your engagement with fans? I mean, specifically on social media. I had an artist that did a um, political song, an anti harbor feminist song, and you know, we put that out there. And I would say that seven out of ten comments were really positive, but three out of ten were less than positive. <laughs> and people were really shocked and saying, I was shocked because I kind of think, listen to music like this is exactly what artists are supposed to do and i i'm just curious like what do you feel do you just say <coughs> i'm not engaging with any of that like let the music speak for itself or do you feel the need to engage or explain or yeah. i'm just kind of curious how people then deal with it. you know it's one thing to say i don't like the negativity but i'm really wondering like how do you handle that Communication you, you, it's, it's, I, I, I literally say there's probably two distinct ways. I had a, I did a show in person. It was with the um, uh, Russia and what's the country? Uh, the, Ukraine. 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 That whole thing was going down situation. They did a show at the Black Fox Lounge in Washington where there actually was a person from Ukraine, a person from Russia. Was there and I'm like, you know, I want you two to get up and shake hands. We're going to have a good, we're going to end this right now. And I didn't get a jokingly kind of situation. And uh, we had music and that kind of stuff. It was a great show. At the show, the girl from Russia, she came up to me and said, I don't see why they need to do that because, you know, they don't want to be this and other in the first place. And she really w w attempted to go in that direction. And I very starkly said, literally, and as I said earlier, this is a safe space and you must be safe here. I'm protecting you and you, I will protect her from you and vice versa. And online, I've dealt with everything from being called everything <laughs> online. And it's not a thing about ignoring it because you can't ignore it. Because if you try to ignore it and act like it's not happening, that's not helping. That's when it grows into something that becomes more powerful than you ever could be. You give, you're seeding your power and it can just, it, it doesn't exist or whatever. 
But you can also pay, uh, also choose to say, you know what, that's the space that they are occupying right now. They've decided to choose the, the time that they've been given, breath to breathe, that they could be loving and doing something productive to, to type and get out that frustration. And most of the time, the frustration they're giving you online has nothing to do with you. There, something's going on at home. You know, there's some things out of their control. They feel they can control 140 characters, and they're going to do that. Do you, and, engage, do you, yeah. do you engage with people, Peter? Did you, like, did you engage with when people were talking about the word clutter? Did you write and explain, or did you let it sit? I did to a certain extent, but I also feel like you need, like, I need to have my own line in the sand for my own mental health of, like, because sometimes you go down the rabbit hole and it's just, it's just come out. more of a rabbit hole. So you will not come out. I feel like I understand. Like I, 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 I'd I, be lying if I said I didn't hate that there's like negative reaction or, you know, there'd be three out of 10 people that, that don't support it. But I also feel like, like if you're trying to be everybody for every, everything for everyone, then you're, you're nothing for, for nobody, you know? So I feel like as much as it's hard to, to swallow, it's like, well, those seven out of 10 people, they're more, engaged with what we're doing now and and they're going to be bigger fans because of the, the stance that you know that that man took and that's a point they yeah. um, listen they will the, your haters buy tickets to your shows and they buy your albums and they download because in order for them to form their thing about you they have to listen to your stuff <laughs> that is the truth i've had people i literally have people either at my shows or my like oh i couldn't stand that song i'm like thank you for your purchase <laughs> thank you so much. but it's the truth tell her tell tell any artist like allow the mentions to stay in the mix it's just the mention and again, I think it also says what you sort of said is it's an encapsulation, it's a, it's a zeitgeist of, of a time. Yep. Yeah. So that's sort of interesting as well. Does yeah. that answer your question? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, anybody else? Okay, amazing. Well, thank you all of you for, for coming and, and being on this panel. And thank you for coming um, and uh, meeting adjourned. Woo! <laughs> social medias. Yeah. If y'all have social media or Twitter, you can follow all of us. Maybe just mention too, yeah, yeah where we can get your oh, yeah. music and what where we oh, can yeah. find you. Uh, Zoe Keating at zoekeating.com. I'm on Twitter is Zoe Cello. Um, more yeah. Zoe Cello. Yeah, if you uh, if you just type Zoe and Cello into Google, I think I'm still the first thing that comes up. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. On Twitter, I'm at Aaron Myers. A A R O N M Y E R S. I've been on Twitter a long time, so I got my name. So at Aaron Myers. So go to Aaron Two dot me. And I have to, as a good board member, say, you know, check out the Capital Hill Jazz Foundation or Crittenden Services of Greater Washington or CTE Vision Foundation <laughs> or Covenant Full Potential Development Center. Think about those things, ask me what they are afterwards, and I'll give you information. Caroline. Uh, you can follow at Good Lovelies, and if uh, you're interested in following me personally, um, you can find out more about my projects, uh, including Secondhand Sunday, which, if you live in Toronto, is a, a community reuse day. It happens twice a year. I started that a few years ago. I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but um, you can follow me at, at Caro B, like the bug, love, like the feeling. Caro uh -huh. B, love. Huh. And I'm uh, at Peter Katz, K T Z, music. In all the places. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we're gonna we'll write up a blog about this and yes. post that as well. And we'll have links to everybody's uh, social media and where to find your music. And we should give a bonus round of applause to Brandon. Yeah. <laughs>